Hello, and welcome everyone to our webinar that's offered jointly by the Mobilize Center and the Restore Center at Stanford University. Um, my name is Matt Petrucci. I'm the scientific program manager of both these centers, and I'm excited to serve as your moderator today. Today's speakers are Ryan Remick and Jens Denham, who will be presenting their clinical gait analysis software using video-based post estimation. The first part of the webinar will cover their validation of their software and results in clinical populations. And in the second part, they will share how to execute this workflow and provide perspectives on best practices for getting optimal results. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Mobilize Center and Restore Centers, which are both supported by the National Institutes of Health. The Mobilize Center is focused on developing and disseminating state-of-the-art biomechanics and machine learning tools for researchers to analyze human movement. The Restore Center is working to make these and other tools for real-world assessment of movement more widely available to the rehab research community. Before we get started, a couple quick reminders about the format of the webinar. Uh, we will have a research talk and then a tutorial, and we'd love to take your questions from both. We'll take your questions at the end of the research talk and at the end of the best practice or of the tutorial. I'm sorry. Please type your questions into the Q&A panel in Zoom. Uh, so not the chat, but the Q&A panel, and we'll review them from there. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, Dr. Ryan Remick is an assistant professor at Kennedy Krieger at the Kennedy Krieger Institute and John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, he is a human movement scientist whose research focuses on motor rehabilitation in persons with neurological damage or disorders. Uh, his research combines principles from engineering, biomechanics, and neuroscience to understand how the nervous system controls movement and to develop new approaches, approaches to movement assessment and rehabilitation. Dr. Jan Stenham is a postdoctoral scholar at the Kennedy Krieger Institute and John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, he is currently working on a project to make objective movement assessments from video readily available to clinicians and researchers. Uh, he holds a PhD in kinesiology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So with that, uh, we are excited to have all of you here today. Uh, I know we're all excited to hear from Ryan and Yan speak on this uh, up and coming topic. And so I'll let them go ahead and begin. Perfect. Thanks, Matt, and, and thanks for everybody uh, hopping on today. Um, let me share my screen really quick. And as I'm doing this, um, before I get started, in addition to saying thanks for the invitation, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to everybody at the Restore and Mobilize Centers for um, all the support over the years. We've been fortunate to be involved with these centers through some of the pilot project uh, awards for, for several years, and uh, those have been very, very helpful in supporting some of this work that you're going to see today. So if anybody listening here or, or later on the recording um, has any interest in pursuing those, those pilot project awards, I would highly encourage you to do so. Yeah, as Matt mentioned, today we'll be talking a lot about how you can use uh, simple videos recorded on readily accessible household devices to do clinical gait analyses. And so to begin, uh, as Matt mentioned, we are members of the Center for Movement Studies here at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. And what our center really aims to understand is first, how the nervous system controls movement, and then second, how we can help people with damage to the nervous system to move better. Our, sister, our, our group here has five different investigators. All of us are interested in movement rehabilitation from one perspective or another. Uh, we have a lot of background in engineering, motor learning. Uh, we have motion capture labs here, non-invasive brain, non brain simulation labs, and also some neuroimaging expertise. And so if anybody listening to this is interested in, in the work we're doing today or other things we might have going on in the lab, Please feel free to, to contact me anytime. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can today from the Q&A, uh, but please also feel free to contact me through my email here offline. Okay, and since our group is really interested in, in studying human movement, one of the questions we ask ourselves a lot is really, how should we be measuring human movement? Most of the people watching this are probably familiar with the three-dimensional motion capture laboratory that you see here on the left side of the, of the slide. And in my view, these probably aren't going anywhere in the foreseeable future. These are gonna kind of remain the gold standard for, for capturing human movement if you need this really granular, really high resolution data that's comprehensive about kinematics, kinetics, and potentially other things like electromyography. However, I'm sure many here are also interested in these emerging techniques like wearable, te wear wearable technologies, excuse me, um, that provide more continuous passive monitoring of human movement in real world situations. And so one limitation of these devices compared to obviously your, your ground truth three-dimensional motion capture laboratories 
is that these devices are often is you know somewhat data limited. You might be only able to collect kind of predefined uh, preset features of movement versus the kind of whole body assessments that you can get from a three-dimensional motion capture lab. And so what I'm going to focus on today is somewhere kind of in the middle with these video-based pose estimation technologies. And so if you're not familiar with, with pose estimation, it's kind of a catch-all term for these computer vision technologies that take in simple digital videos that can be recorded from a simple household device, like a tablet or a smartphone or a webcam, and then identify and track different anatomical locations on the body automatically. So you can get this kind of full body kinematic assessment that's somewhat similar to what you can get from a motion capture laboratory, only here you're only relying on a device that you, know, you might have in your pocket. And so in our lab, we've, for the past several years, we've been exploring many different applications of these technologies. Um, what you might see when you, when you run one of these analyses is something like this. So here we have somebody simply walking across the floor. Uh, we're recording a video and you can also see that they have motion capture markers placed around their body. And after we apply these pose estimation technologies, we get this colorful skeleton that you see here overlaid over the exact same video that you just saw. So again, here we're able to, in an automated fashion, both identify and track these different anatomical key points as this person's walking across the floor. We're also, as I will talk about today, interested in applying these technologies in a variety of different clinical populations. And so one relevant aspect of clinical populations is they often uh, use assisted devices and other, and other sorts of tech that change how they actually appear in these videos. So here's a, a video of, of someone who's had a stroke walking with a caregiver. And one thing to note here is that you can see this person is wearing an ankle foot orthotic uh, on their lower limb here on the left leg. And despite the presence of this device, we're still able to apply these technologies and track that movement accurately. So despite the fact that the, the person appears fundamentally different in the image here than perhaps some of the images that were used to train these pose estimation algorithms, we've still seen that we're able to, to track movement um, in these people with different wearable devices. There's also been interest in understanding whether these technologies can be used for people whose bodies might be proportioned differently than, than many of the, again, the images that are used to train these algorithms. So here you can see we have this cute little toddler here who's going to be walking across the floor. And despite the fact that her body is proportioned quite uh, dissimilarly from an adult's body, we can still track her movement well as she moves toward the camera. Today, our focus is going to be on walking, but our lab has also interested in, in assessing other uh, aspects of human movement. And so here you can see this is actually a, an old video of me sitting in my living room uh, recording on my iPhone. And here we've also included a hand model in, in the pose estimation uh, approach that we use. So not only are we tracking my whole body, but we're able to track my fingers and my hand as, as I open and close it repetitively. Finally, one other question that we get often is, what kind of recording device, what kind of video quality do you need to be able to perform these analyses? And so to test this, we went about as far back as we could. Um, this is one of the earliest known videos of, of someone with Parkinson's disease recorded over 100 years ago. And you can see that despite the black and white quality, the poor quality of this video, um, we're still able to track this person's movement. So we're confident that we can use these approaches across a wide variety of different uh, videos of, of different qualities. So in a nutshell, what we're going to be talking about today is this considerable potential that we see for using this technology to address uh, expanding needs for both remote measurement or remote assessment of movement, and then also potentially delivery of tele-rehab. So our big picture goal is kind of this. We really envision this clinician-centered use of pose estimation for conducting remote assessments of movement and delivery of tele-rehab. Before we dive into our papers today, I want to, I want to make two main points. Um, the approaches that we're talking about today, one, are, are certainly not intended to replace the clinician. We again want to emphasize this clinician-centered approach where they get the data and then the data that they receive helps to inform their clinical decision making. And two, we're not really interested in trying to replace a, you know, the three-dimensional motion capture laboratory either. We're trying to use household technologies to provide data to these clinicians that they can again use to make decisions for their patients. And so because of this, we've done a lot of, of different interviews and we're, we're talking to different clinicians on a day-to-day on a -day basis. Um, and we've really started to aggregate these different requests in terms of what do they want from these technologies and what can we deliver to them that will be the most useful um, in their day-to-day -day, uh, clinics. And so we've started to put together these lists of requests and that's really helped to guide the constraints that we've placed on our approach. So first here, one common request that we get from the clinicians is they don't want any additional equipment or setup and kind of going along with this, they don't want to spend any additional time uh, performing these assessments beyond what they would see in their current clinical standard. 
So they'd prefer not to have to calibrate anything. They would prefer to be able to use single devices. And you'll see that next. That they want to be using something that they already have. They don't want to have to purchase something new in order to be able to, to conduct these assessments. And then ultimately, they want to receive something back um, that's pretty direct and pretty interpretable. So a commons kind of standardized set of, of results that they can use again to inform their clinical decision making. And so what this means in summary is that we've really kind of distilled this down to most of the clinicians that we talk to really want a point and click solution. They want to be able to use the device they already have in their pocket to record a video and get something interpretable and meaningful back. And so that's where we're going with the, with the rest of the presentation today. How can we deliver uh, this point and click solution to our clinicians and end, user, end users? Excuse me. Uh, who are these clinicians and end users? We've had significant interest around Kennedy Krieger and, and Hopkins here in terms of both uh, the spectrum of different conditions and behaviors that people are interested in studying. Uh, you can see on this list, there's a variety of both um, conditions that are most common in older adults, conditions that are common in pediatric populations, and a variety of different both upper and lower extremity uh, of behaviors. Today, we're going to focus on, on two patient populations in particular, uh, people who've had a stroke or people with Parkinson's disease. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we'll focus primarily on reaching, although if anybody has uh, questions about any of these other clinical populations or these different behaviors that we're tracking, please feel free to, to reach out to me either uh, during the talk or, or offline afterward. Okay, so in addition to the requests that we receive from clinicians in terms of how we should be uh, formulating and delivering these tools to them, we also have a series of commonly asked questions that, that we receive in terms of the usability and general usefulness of these, of these applications. And so probably the most common question that we get is simply how accurate is it? And then also people often wanna know if it's validated in their specific patient group of interest, whether it can measure their particular behavior of interest, and then ultimately, and this is where we probably spend a majority of our time nowadays uh, working on these applications, is really addressing this issue of usability. So clinicians and end users really want to know, okay, this is great, it looks cool, but ultimately, how do we use it? And so we'll be walking through these different questions step by step today to hopefully provide some at least preliminary answers to them. Okay, so the first uh, paper that I'll talk about today is a paper that I worked on with Jan and Christina Rossi a couple of years ago. Um, this paper is published in, in Plus Computational Biology, so it's open access. You can, you can access it uh, freely available on, on PubMed or, or your search of choice. And this was really our first step into looking to see how well we can um, use these video-based technologies to get a human gait assessment that you know, approximates what we see in our motion capture lab. I want to begin talking about this paper by thanking this group that published this open data set. Um, without this data set, we would not have been able to do this preliminary work during the pandemic. So there's a, a paper available here um, that provides both simultaneous motion capture and um, video data. You can see uh, the motion capture on the left and the videos on the right. The useful thing about this is that it doesn't only provide one perspective of the video, but there's two. So you can see if I play this again, we can receive video from both uh, sides of the body as the person's walking across the floor. So single motion capture stream, but two uh, simultaneous videos. And so what we did with this is we used a pre-chain network that was, open, uh, that was freely available online called OpenPose. And that's what you see on the top here. So again, we took um, excuse me, the video that I just showed you on the previous slide and applied the OpenPose algorithm to it to be able to track the person's movements as they walk across the floor. And then we performed a series of calculations on, on these walking patterns to see how closely we could estimate a variety of different, both spatiotemporal and kinematic gait parameters that we measured from the ground truth motion capture. And so this is really getting at this first question that we receive all the time, which is like, you know, this output video that you have with the colorful skeleton looks really cool, but how accurate is it? And so to begin, I'll start by talking about some spatiotemporal gate parameters. Um, to orient you to the format of, of this data, uh, this is going to be consistent across the next few slides at least. We'll have each row will represent a different parameter. So here you're seeing step time uh, going left to right. And then on each of these different panes, you'll see a different comparison. So on the first column, you're seeing open pose camera one, which is the camera recording from the left side of the person as they walk across the floor. On the x-axis here, you're seeing a step time from the motion capture, so the ground truth step time. Similarly, in the middle column here, you're seeing the opposite camera, so from the right, uh, the step time as derived from the open pose assessment of that video. And then here again on the x-axis is step time and motion capture. 
And then in the third column here, you're seeing uh, the two cameras compared to each other. So the open pose analyses from each camera to assess whether the, the perspective on the person from left to right uh, makes a difference. And so here, this is showing you all steps across all participants that were included in that data set. Uh, there were, I think, 32 total participants completing these uh, overground gate trials in this data set. And you can see here across all the different comparisons we make, we see very strong uh, correlations between both the open pose analyses and motion capture and between the two different perspectives with the open pose analyses. This is an individual step-by-step -step basis, but oftentimes what we get in the clinic from something like a gate mat is a more summary statistic. And so here what I'm showing you on the next set of data are individual participant means. So if we collapse across all the steps and, and calculate a simple individual participant average, uh, we can see that the accuracy improves significantly such that we receive very, very strong correlations again across all of these comparisons. Now, temporal parameters are pretty straightforward. We can set up an algorithm that Jan will walk you through a little bit later to see, to detect important gate events like heel strike and toe off that'll allow us to calculate these different uh, temporal parameters as people walk across the floor. But of course, when we're studying walking, we're typically interested in spatiotemporal information. So there's also a need to be able to calculate spatial gate parameters. And since these are simply digital videos in pixel space, we need to come up with an approach to translate this pixel space into known uh, distance in the real world. And so Jan has a GUI here uh, that he'll walk you through a little bit later that allows us to do that as long as we have um, some points of reference in the frame that we know how far uh, we know the distance between these points. Like for example, you can see we've selected these two pieces of tape on either end of the room here. We can input that distance and then scale the video uh, such that we can convert pixels into, into real units of distance. And so when we did that, we're now able to calculate step lengths. And so what I'm showing you here is formatted again, exactly like the previous slide with the different camera views versus motion capture here on the left, and then the camera views versus each other here on the right. And again, showing you all steps on the top, we see strong correlations between uh, the different measurements of step length. And again, these improve uh, when we calculate an individual mean, uh, calculate the same metrics at the individual participant level. And so if we wanted to be, get, get a simple summary statistic, what is someone's average step length? What is someone's average step time? Uh, we show that we can do this well uh, using these, these video-based approaches. Uh, notably here, I'm showing you step length and step time, but if you refer back to the paper, you'll see that there are a wide variety of other spatial temporal gate parameters um, provided in, in more detail. Obviously, people are off, often interested in walking speed as well, which combines both the step length and step time information. And so here we see, uh, again, video-based estimates of gate speed across these different participants show strong correlations with, with the ground truth motion capture. However, it is important to note that when we're dealing with uh, these kind of spatial transformations that we're making, there are significant uh, drawbacks and significant limitations. So in our approach, depending on where the person is at in the walkway, this can of course significantly change the perspective uh, on which, with which you're looking at the person in the video. So these two images that you see here are synced in time. And so this is when the person is at the far left end of the walkway over here. You can see here, if we're looking from camera one, the step length, uh, the feet appear you know, much farther apart than they do in the image on the bottom. And this, of course, in turn affects the open pose uh, measurement of step length. So here you can see the open pose measurement of step length uh, overshoots the, the ground truth as measured by motion capture. And at, again, at the same point in time, uh, if you're looking from the opposite view, you can see that it, it undershoots that step length. So understanding where the person is at along the walkway and how the change in perspective and potential issues of, of image parallax can really be important for understanding the accuracy of your spatial estimates using our approach. And here's just another example at the other end of the walkway. Uh, these are again, coincident points in time. Um, here on the top, you can see open pose underestimates step length relative to the ground truth. And here it overestimates. Okay, putting this in, in kind of uh, less anecdotal terms and showing you the whole data. You can see these trends that I just described on the previous slide here across all the steps that we were able to measure. So as people move left to right across the walkway, depending on the perspective that you're viewing them from, um, the accuracy changes with accuracy being optimal kind of right here in the center of the walkway when you're getting a you know, nearly purely sagittal view of the person. And this is probably seen most clearly in the bottom right here when you're comparing the two different camera views to each other, you can see these really kind of linearly intersecting uh, patterns of data such that there's almost an X here uh, comparing the two, when you compare the two camera views. Again, highlighting those changes as people walk across the walkway. 
Okay, moving on from, from spatial temporal parameters, here are our sagittal kinematics that we, we observed in, in these participants. You can see here um, that we found that the hip and, hip and knee angles in particular uh, could be estimated relatively accurately using either of the camera views. Um, ankle also showed, you know, if we look at the correlation coefficients, they, they're usually relatively strong. Um, however, we've noticed this across several data sets now that when we're using open pose for our, our video-based gait analyses, that the ankle is, is certainly the, the hardest um, angle to measure in terms of the lower extremity. And so there's just a caveat here. You, know, you can still get decent estimates, but you should expect a little bit more error when you're looking uh, more distally down the leg. Okay, and so this, this paper was um, helpful in, in guiding us where we wanted to go next. And so we, we really started to consider how can we make this more usable. And so one benefit of the data that we showed you previously was that these data were all recorded in a motion capture laboratory. Um, this is an R motion capture laboratory, but I, I wanted to get a picture of the, the kind of the biggest motion capture laboratory I could find to really emphasize this point. But the point is really that if you're recording a sagittal view of the person, you need this relatively wide open space such that you can be far enough from the participant to get a sagittal view of them walking with multiple strides. And so while those data were recorded in something more like this, Jan and I started to consider that the real world where you're trying to do these assessments probably looks something more like this. You might want to be recording these videos directly inside a patient's home in a narrow hallway or inside a, a relatively cramped clinical facility, maybe even inside of an inpatient hospital room or along a long hospital corridor where it may not be possible to get these kind of wide angle views of your participant or your patient as they're walking across the floor. And so we wanted to then be able to start to do this in a more versatile way that could accommodate multiple different camera views and test this directly in patients. And again, I want to acknowledge the Restore Center here because they really helped to fund some of this work um, and help us to develop this approach as we've gone along. So thanks again to, to everybody with Restore. Okay, so next Jan started to work on whether we could do this with a frontal view of a participant. <clears throat> and so to show you here, we started to take an approach where we considered how the person changes in size throughout the video as they move toward or away from the camera. And so here you can see on the left, this we show an image of a person closer to the camera, and then as they move farther, of course, they look smaller on the, on the image. We considered it if, if we know how big the person looks on the camera initially, and we know their initial starting position in terms of their distance from the camera, we might be able to use these geometric relationships <laughs> that result from a change in depth. And so again, if we know this parameter C that tells us how far the person is at position X naught relative to the position of the camera at XC, and then they walk some distance or change depth delta D, by using these geometric relationships, we can be then use the relative size of the person image in order to, the relative person, size of the person in the image, excuse me, to estimate this change in, in real world depth that has been approximated over time. And so if you simplify these equations, you get this uh, simple equation here that shows you the size ratio and its relationship to the initial distance of the person from the camera and then their change in distance over time. And so here's just an example as the person's moving farther and farther from the camera at known distances uh, that we had set in the hallway here. This is an anecdotal example showing you that this simple equation here can accurately fit um, those changes in, in depth over time. So long story short, by knowing how far the person was from the camera and how much their size changes as they move uh, toward or away from the camera, we're able to estimate their change in position or their change in depth. And so we started to test this. Um, I'll orient you again to, to the format of, of these slides here. These are a little bit different. So now on the, Again, each row is gonna be a separate uh, gate parameter. On the y-axis here in the first column, we're showing you video-based estimates of the person from the front as they were walking away from the camera. On the second column here, we're showing you video-based estimates of these parameters from the frontal view as people walk toward the camera. And then again, on the third um, column here, we're showing you video-based estimates of the front versus video-based estimates of the front as they walk away. So toward and versus away, excuse me. And so again here, this was exciting to us to see because now we can see that these frontal based assessments of, of the person walking also correlate strongly with ground truth motion capture. So we use that same data set that we had used earlier of, of the healthy adults without gait impairment to begin to test this frontal view. And similarly, when we, when we studied step length here in addition to step time, 
we again found strong correlations with everything around you know r equals 0.9 uh, so very strong correlations between these frontal assessments of, of walking and the motion capture based data and finally again combining these to, to estimate gait speed we're again able to estimate gait speed with with a relatively high degree of accuracy okay so then in the next question as you know the title of our talk today suggests we wanted to be able to do this in a clinical setting or at least to start to investigate clinical populations and so the next question we wanted to address is is this validated in patients and we did this in two separate patient populations uh, first i'll show you people with with parkinson's disease and then i'll show you persons post-stroke and so i wanted to note that uh, these these data were all collected in our lab uh, this shows uh, 19 persons with parkinson's disease and 40 people with stroke and so we, uh, if anybody are interested in these data, we have simultaneous video and motion capture recordings, both from the sagittal view and from the frontal view for these patients. And so here again, beginning with step time, these, uh, these are again, these, the format here is a little bit different. So let me walk you through this quickly. On the y-axis here, on the first column, we're showing you the step time uh, resulting from the sagittal video view uh, using, again, our open pose based gait analysis versus the motion capture along the x-axis. In the second column, we're showing you the, the frontal assessment uh, of step time versus, again, motion capture. And then in the third column, frontal versus sagittal here. So we're using both of our workflows um, that I've shown you on the, on the previous few slides. And so again, when we, whether we look at the sagittal uh, estimates of step time, the frontal estimates of step time, we see these strong correlations between the open pose analyses and the, uh, the motion capture data. And the same applies for both step length uh, from the sagittal and, and frontal views and walking speed from the sagittal and frontal views. So here, even in people with Parkinson's disease, it's a very heterogeneous population. You can see we have a wide variety of different preferred walking speeds. Um, we're able to estimate these different spatiotemporal gait parameters with a, a strong degree of accuracy when compared to the ground truth. One thing that we also wanted to be able to do in these clinical populations is begin to estimate you know, condition-specific features of walking, so things that might be clinically relevant to these uh, different patient populations in particular. And so one thing we measured, um, people with Parkinson's disease often walk with stooped posture. And so we were also interested in seeing if we could measure their trunk inclination during uh, their preferred walking. And so here, again, we're showing the sagittal. We didn't do this with our frontal um, uh, analyses because we wanted to you know, get that inclination from the side. But here we're showing you our sagittal estimates of, of trunk inclination versus ground truth motion capture. And again, we see a strong correlation showing that we can estimate these more condition-specific parameters in addition to our more standardized battery. Uh, sagittal kinematics, these look similar to what I had shown you. Uh, we still only are... are calculating kinematics from sagittal views. We haven't uh, tried to expand it into our frontal analysis yet. Uh, but when we look at these sagittal views, even in these, these patient populations, you'll notice that the um, measurements we get of these different joint kinematics uh, are very good. They're, they agree uh, very strongly with the motion capture data that we get across the hip, the knee, and the ankle. As I mentioned, we also collected uh, 40 people with data on 40 people with stroke. And so these are formatted identically to the, the slide you just saw with people with Parkinson's disease. We have the sagittal versus motion capture in the, in the first column, frontal versus motion capture in the second, and then the two video comparisons against each other in the third. Here again, for step time, step length, and walking speed, we see uh, significant and, and very strong correlations between all of our video-based approaches and, and the ground truth motion capture data. And then again, in stroke, we wanted to try to uh, take a look at some condition-specific clinically relevant parameters. So here, we oftentimes people with stroke um, not only walk slower than people without stroke, but they also walk more asymmetrically. And so we investigated whether we could capture step time and step length uh, asymmetries using our, our video-based approaches. Uh, we found, again, significant correlations across the board, although we do note that our sagittal workflow um, the correlations in our sagittal workflow are, are significantly stronger than those that you see in our frontal workflow. And I, we think that's probably because these are relatively sensitive measures. Um, you can see that the magnitudes of these parameters are, are relatively small. And so by having more precision with our, our sagittal-based workflows, we weren't entirely surprised to see that these uh, appear, appear to outperform um, the estimates that we get from our frontal-based workflows. And again, uh, just reemphasizing what I had shown you previously in the, in the 
persons with Parkinson's disease, we get good estimates of sagittal joint kinematics using our sagittal open pose workflow. Uh, one notable thing you can really see in these data are, are more kinematic asymmetries in, in the participants. Um, the top column, or the, excuse me, the top row here shows data from the paretic leg, and the bottom uh, row shows data from the non paretic leg. And you can see from these video-based analyses, we're able to notice this kind of basically 20 degree um, change in, in maximum knee flexion observed between the legs, which is common after stroke. Oftentimes people with stroke are not able to flex their paretic knee uh, to the same degree that they can flex their non-paretic knee. So again, demonstrating the ability to capture these clinically relevant gait parameters directly in patient populations. Okay, the last set of data here I'll show you quickly. We really wanted to know too, um, with particular relevance for rehabilitation and recovery, whether we can actually measure changes in, in patient walking patterns. And so when we collected these data on, on people with stroke and Parkinson's disease, we not only collected gait data at their preferred walking speeds, but we also collected data at their fastest comfortable walking speeds. And so what I'm showing you on this slide are the deltas between those two different gait trials. And so here on the y-axis, you're seeing the difference in step time between the fast and preferred walking speeds uh, as calculated by our, our sagittal workflow versus our motion capture workflow here on the x-axis. And then again, our frontal here in the second column and then the two video views versus each other in the third column. And so the, the persons with Parkinson's disease are in diamonds. They might be a little small. And I'm sorry if those aren't easy to make out on, on Zoom. Um, and square, the squares are, are people with stroke and then the different colors just indicate the different legs. And so again, showing you changes in step time, step length, and gait speed, you can see that we observe strong correlations here in measuring that change that occurs um, from preferred to fast walking. So we do think that if a participant experiences an improvement in gait speed over time as a result of rehabilitation, or a decrement in gait speed over time uh, as a result of progression of disease or injury, that we we're confident we should be able to capture those using these video-based assessments based on these um, comparisons that we made with our lab-based data. And so to, to go back to the commonly asked questions and kind of provide a summary for each of these, uh, the first question, how accurate is it? Well, we know that a lot of the different parameters that I've shown you today are strongly correlated with ground truth uh, motion capture data. So we feel confident that these are uh, at least, you know, uh, suitably accurate for many different clinical applications. Second, is it validated in my patient group of interest? We've shown you data in, in people without gait impairment, in persons post-stroke, and persons with Parkinson's disease. Can it measure my behavior of interest? Uh, as I mentioned earlier here, we're showing walking, but we have done uh, similar studies in a, in a variety of other different behaviors as well. And then finally, how do we use it? And so that's what I, I think we'll spend the rest of the, the webinar on today. I'll, I'll turn it over to Jan, and he'll be able to show you step-by-step -step, uh, how to go about using this code. And so again, a quick thanks to the Mobilize and Restore Centers for inviting us today. And, and also thank you to all the, the funding sources here that have supported some of this work. And, and of course, the people in my lab who have executed the work, Jan and, and Hannah Kornman and, and Melody Shu have done a lot of this work. So um, with that, either I can start answering questions or we can turn it over to Jan for the tutorial. Great, thanks Ryan for a super clear talk. Um, we may be able to take just a few questions. I uh, would like to make sure we have enough time for, for the tutorial. And then if we complete that early, we can, we can come back to some of these questions that have come in. Um, just had several questions asking about using this in different populations, obviously used it in stroke and Parkinson's, um, but um, maybe how well do you think that like open pose would perform in say populations that are infants or maybe with bone deformities or other things like that? Yeah, yeah. So we have been using it in kids as young as 12 months old to study different behaviors, um, not necessarily walking, but we have been doing it. We've been studying some different um, nonverbal communication behaviors in these kids, and we're still able to track them reasonably well. Uh, we have tried a variety of different pose estimation algorithms. Everything that I showed you today was open pose. Um, and across different algorithms, we've had varying degrees of success. Uh, I won't spend too much time. We haven't done it in walking. So if people are interested specifically in pediatric walking, we haven't studied that yet. But it does, see, you know, a variety of different algorithms are available to track infant movements. Uh, one other thing that I'll point to is um, James Cotton has also done some very interesting work uh, in this general area. And he has studied people with um, prosthetics and found that it can be difficult, obviously, to track the, the 
the prosthetic leg compared to the intact leg. And so that's one thing that people might consider if they're starting to use this in those clinical populations, again, where the appearance of the person has fundamentally changed uh, versus what the image training set might contain. Great. Yep. And maybe just one more quick question and then we'll switch over. Uh, it's from Savik Das Gupta. Uh, often we see a lab coat effect in subjects inside the gate lab. Uh, could a technology like yours be used to conduct overground experiments outside, uh, for example, in daily living or uh, for gate analysis um, in home? Yeah. yeah. I would say stay tuned on that. We're, we're definitely trying that. The, the home-based um, applications are, I, I kind of mm -hmm. tend to say they're more Wild West applications because you're relying probably on somebody other than you to collect the videos and you have to worry about data standardization and all those kinds of things. Um, with our frontal view, I should have mentioned this during the talk, what it's really intended to be is you need to know that initial distance that the person is from the camera. So you can imagine where that's kind of ideally suited for a clinical setting where you're recording the video in the same location every time and maybe you have a start spot on the floor so you always know exactly how far the person is from your mounted camera or your tablet or whatever you're using yep. sure. harder to do in the home but but we think possible <laughs>